Interesting. Now, what are the enablers of uh, the uh, knowledge management? Um, obviously, there are some players. Right. Well, I believe the enablers are technology, leadership, and culture. I call it the TLC, Technology, Leadership, and Culture of Knowledge Management. And those three, I think, have to be in all knowledge management implementations. Now, the challenge for leaders is to decide the balance of those three. So we have to have some balance of technology, some balance of leadership, and some balance of culture. Today, the technology piece is becoming easier. Uh, many years ago, technology was one of the most difficult ones. So today, technology is quite easy, and that's not as much of a challenge for some organizations. But leadership and culture are so important. Do we have senior leaders buy in to the project? Do they really believe in what we're doing? Do we have a culture of needing to know rather than needing to share? You know, in many organizations, especially or certainly in the United States where I'm working right now, uh, there's a culture of need to know. In other words, we don't share things unless we know that you need to know it. It really comes from uh, the Second World War. And in the Second World War, when American troops were in the south of England, there was a campaign called Loose Lips Sink Ships. And the fear was that if the soldiers went into the local towns and talked to people about their preparations for D-Day, then it could be devastating for the troops when it finally happened. So they ingrained in all of the people, both in uh, England and in the United States, this idea that we must not talk about what we're doing. And of course, that's very important for defense and security issues. It's very important in business for your trade secrets to do that. But in an organization, I would argue that other than those very secret ideas that must be guarded, we should operate in an, uh, an environment of needing to share. In other words, I should openly share with you. I should be transparent within my team and make sure that they know everything that I know. And that's so important but difficult to do. Very easy to say, very difficult to put into practice. So the three enablers really are technology, leadership, and culture. Technology is fascinating now as we move into the era of Web 2.0 on the internet. And as we're moving from an internet that was based on people pushing material to us to one that's very collaborative. And in Web 2.0, as you know, many of us can uh, collaborate through the internet, but we can also uh, now find knowledge from sources that we might not otherwise have done. In the past, for instance, for news, we might get all of our news from the established and known media organizations. Today, we're seeing news come from all sorts of areas, from bloggers, from people on Facebook, and it's really changing the dynamics of many industries, uh, especially knowledge-intensive ones. Okay. Now, what are the trends in, in, the, in business, the new ones? Yeah, there's some exciting things, and many of them are surrounded around this Web 2.0. One of my favorite ones is something called crowdsourcing. And crowdsourcing is a term that was first coined by Jeff Howe, who was uh, the editor of uh, Fast Magazine. But what he talked about is how we can now use people outside of our organization to gain the knowledge that we know. Let me give you an example. In the pharmaceutical industry, it's a very long, complex, and expensive process to develop a new drug. And often they'll find that they struggle with a particular chemical combination or molecular biology that they have to work on. And even with all of the experts they have working in the large pharmaceuticals, sometimes they can't crack that solution. Now in the past, that would cause the project to stall. But now they've found ways to take that problem and let other people anywhere in the world solve the problem. And all they release is enough so that the person can solve the exact problem. They don't give away the trade secrets of the drug that they're working on. And by doing this, what they find is that there's retired chemistry professors and biology professors and other people all over the world who love to solve these complex problems. Now the benefit for the pharmaceuticals is they don't pay unless somebody solves it. So they have literally an army of scientists and engineers working on these problems for free. If they solve it, yes, they do pay them, but they have, a, uh, they have uh, the opportunity to work with just so many other people that they couldn't possibly have in their organization. So that idea of crowdsourcing is a very, very interesting one. Now, of course, we have to be careful because we must make sure that we guard the knowledge that's most important to us. We must not get ourselves into an environment where all of our knowledge is out across the environment. Uh, but if we can selectively do that to solve those very tough business problems, I think we can uh, really gain, gain from that. So crowdsourcing is one great example. Another one is some work that's come out of uh, Forrester Research in the United States that looked at what they call the groundswell, how regular people are using the internet and using technology to change the way businesses operate. And you'll know that on many websites now, you and I can be critics. 
We can rate people, we can rate news stories, we can rate products. Now before the consumer didn't have that power, now we can do that. And we've seen some fascinating examples of network armies revolting against a particular product or a particular group. The power of that, the power of the people and the wisdom of the people has never been amassed like that before.